Richard Koch, you are a former manage, management consultant. You are an entrepreneur. You have written several books on how to apply the 80-20 principles. In fact, I count here about 25 books. Your books have sold over a million copies and they have been published in 40 languages. And today we're here to talk about your latest book, Unreasonable Success and How to Achieve It. Great, Richard, welcome. Very good. Podcast. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you for inviting me. So, uh, Richard, uh, I mean, it didn't start out for you as an author. You started as a consultant. Could you tell us a little bit about how, I mean, you were going to high school or to school. How did you end up being a consultant? Well, that's a good question. Um, I left university when I was 20, just 20, turning 21. And I worked in industry for uh, three years. And then I worked for Shell initially, the oil company. And then I worked for um, a company called Pedigree Pet Foods. It made pet food for dogs and cats and goodness knows what else. It was part though of the Mars group. So Mars Confectionery, Mars Bars and all the rest of it, run by some very unusual people. Uh, actually, I, I grew to like them, but they were certainly highly eccentric. Uh, one of the things they <laughs> had was a good timekeeping bonus where if you uh, clocked in, you had to clock in, it, you could be the general manager and you still had to, to punch a time clock. And um, if, you, if you clocked in on time, you got a 10% bonus. But of course, everyone sort of thought of that as part of their salary. So, so you had people rushing over the bridge into the, into the factory uh at sort of one minute to eight in the morning <laughs> and knocking people out of the way so that they could clock in and not lose 10 percent of their uh their wages um it was a it was a very interesting thing but frankly i hated it <laughs> anyway i went off to business school i wasn't very successful in my first couple of jobs i have to say uh, i got very good jobs and they paid me a lot of money but once they got me <laughs> they didn't like me how, how about school were you a good student Oh yeah, I was a great student. Yeah, I got a top degree um, from Oxford. So yeah, that, I mean that's one one good thing. Okay, but great. actually working <laughs> working in in industry wasn't a great success. Anyway, so I was good at passing examinations and all rest. So what did I do? I went off to business school, and I went off to business school in Philadelphia. Um, I was I was living in the UK. I'm British originally, and I'm still British actually, and. Um, uh, so I, I went off to Warden and did an MBA and uh, did that for two years. I loved living in Philadelphia. I thought it was a great place, really nice place. Although, you know, you don't choose Montreal for the weather. I didn't choose Philadelphia for the weather because it's terribly hot in the summer and terribly cold in winter. Uh, uh, but great place, Look, very happening, great vibe. Lots of nice people, lots of nightclubs, which I was interested in those days and things like that. Um, so anyway, having finished my degree, I realized that actually I hadn't really studied anything that was very marketable. So, I, you know, Warden is known for finance, but I didn't major in finance. Uh, Warden, Warden's also known for other things like operations research and marketing and even industrial relations. And I didn't major in those. I had what they called an individualized major which meant I, did, I studied whatever I wanted to. I got great, great grades. I got distinctions in nearly all, in fact, all but one of the, of the uh, courses, if you want to know <laughs> about my academic record. But it was pretty useless uh, because um, I, I didn't know anything useful, really. Uh, so I interviewed with people and I was very, very lucky to get a job with the Boston Consulting Group at a time that it was a very small organization. And, uh, and so I worked for BCG for three or four years. Then I was very unsuccessful in that <laughs> job too, <laughs> because um, I, thought I, was, I thought I was very good at the job. I got on with my clients very well and I understood the concepts very well, but I couldn't do analysis, quantitative analysis. And you know, Alan, to this day, I cannot use a spreadsheet. I don't use Excel. I, I, I add it up <laughs> myself. On, but I don't use an abacus, but I do use a, a, a Hewlett Packard, a quite sophisticated uh, calculator, but that's the limit of my <laughs> quantitative skills. Um, so I worked there for four years. I got 
I mean, I, I made lots of money for them and, and for myself as well, but they thought I wasn't really, I wasn't really uh, uh, good at what they particularly wanted to do. And so they fired me in effect. I mean, I resigned, but they, they fired me. <laughs> but then at that stage, I decided I still wanted to do what they did. It, it wasn't really management consulting. It was, it was the sort of consulting that very, very bright people who were wet behind the ears could do. Uh, so it was, it was uh, analysis of markets and financial data and looking at the market positions of each of the companies involved. Um, and I thought that was great stuff and I actually thought it was great, but I wanted other people to do the hard work of, uh, <laughs> of doing all the quantitative analysis. And of course you could do that if you were very senior in the company, but as a junior person, you couldn't. Um, so I never escaped from being a junior person, but I joined a competitor of the Boston Consulting Group called Bain and & Company, and they were even smaller than, than BCG and younger. They were an offshoot originally from, from the Boston Consulting Group. And they were looking for people because they, they had lots and lots of business, but they found it quite hard to do recruiting. So they took me and uh, I worked for them for three years, with them for four years, uh, three years. And they made me a partner, which was quite amazing. You know, now I, don't know, I don't know how they managed to think that that was a good idea. But anyway, they, they did. And, um, and then, of course, after three years, I decided that it was much more fun to own a strategy consultancy than to work in one that was some, run by, owned by somebody else. So three of us from the London office of uh, Bain & Company decided to set up what was called LEK. I was the K, the Kosh, and there was a guy called Jim Lawrence and a guy called Ian Evans, so LEK. And uh, hey, you know, we started with three people. After five years, we had 350 people. Wow. Wow. We had lots of profits. We made, we had very, very high margins. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but it's a long time ago. And um, we, um, it was great fun. We hired some fantastic people, many of whom are still friends and business associates of mine. Uh, and it was, it was absolutely fabulous. I did that though for five years. And then I wanted to turn LEK into a sort of mergers and acquisitions type of firm, uh, uh, you know, doing strategic due, due diligence and advising companies on acquisitions, because that seemed to me a, a very high growth niche and a very profitable niche. And although my partners were um, happy to do some of that, they didn't want to specialize in that. They didn't want to be, have all their eggs in one basket, whereas I'm a great believer in having all your eggs in one basket. And so um, after a time, we decided that we ought to part ways. And that's how I started as a management consultant. And Alan, how I ended as a management wow. consultant. Okay, so you're going to tell us about the end in a second. But uh, we're going to start with your education. So you made up your whole schedule. You choose the classes that you wanted to take. You didn't go with the system, whatever system there was available. Would you say that that's a viable approach to go with your passion as opposed to go with the rigorous uh, path created for you? And um, so we have this tendency of going with your bliss, follow your passion. And some people succeed and some people fail. So I, I don't know what's your impression about that. That's a very, also a very good question. I think it depends on your personality. And I think it depends on how arrogant you are in a way, how um, self, a nice way of saying that is self-confident. Uh, and I've always just basically done it my way, you know, Frank Sinatra. Right. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times that doesn't work out very well because the system will throw you out. Wharton was a very, very liberal uh, and... Um, uh, how shall I say, quite easygoing business school. Now that might sound like a contradiction in terms, because if you think about business schools, everyone thinks about the Harvard Business School or maybe Stanford. Uh, and the Harvard Business School is like being in the army, you know, sort of, you know, you get drilled into groups, you have to have joint sessions, you all have to work on the same problem, you have to shout louder than other people, uh, you have to study all the cases, you have to work for 80 hours a week, and basically you get ground down uh, into the dust and, uh, and and some people survive most people survive and some people don't but there's no there's no sort of let a thousand flowers bloom 
philosophy at the Harvard Business School. Well, there wasn't when my friends were, were there, and I don't think there is now. So it depends on, on the school. You know, if it's a school which allows you to be a little bit unconform, non-conformist and to, to do your own thing, then that's great. Uh, and I've always done my own thing. I mean, in BCG, I did my own thing, and that's why they threw me out. But it was, it was very nice. Well, <laughs> and then you start your own. You see, the reason I wanted to start my own business, Alan, although I had two partners and eventually a lot more partners, was because I wanted to do my own. I wanted to make my own decisions. And um, I think if you're, if you're confident enough, and as I say, if you're uh, pig headed enough to do that, it's a great thing to do. But if you just want to slot into an organization and you want to you know, make a reasonable amount of money and you want to have a nice job and you don't want to work weekends and nights and, and so on and so forth, which is sometimes required when you're starting a business, then uh, that's great. If you do want to uh, basically do exactly what you want to do, then you have to be prepared to um, find other people who don't agree with you sometimes. Right. Okay, so I also get the uh, sense that you are a big, big picture thinking. You see the forest and you don't want to be bogged down with little details. And in regards to success and being successful, for example, I have a par business partner and she's the one who collects, uh, corrects all my mistakes. I make so many mistakes, but I'm the one who starts new ideas and new visions and let's do this and, you know, I'm many fail. But because I have this kind of visionary uh, uh, impetus, that's why we start things. But I couldn't do anything without my partner who is always correcting after my mistakes. Uh, do you think uh, we need this balance of a, a big picture thinking and a person who grinds down the detail? And which one of those two have bigger possibilities of success? Well, I think you've answered your own question, haven't you? You do, <laughs> and I do, and and your colleague, who I'm sure is wonderful, uh, you know, is probably delight, delighted to be in that role. Um, but I've always had people who clear up after me, people who can add up, <laughs> and I can't, and stuff, people who can do the Excel sh spreadsheets, because they're sometimes necessary. Uh, and in fact, if I come on and talk a little bit about my book, Unreasonable Success and How to Achieve It, the, the key thing about I, I, I decided to start with 20 people who'd been very successful uh, and nobody could argue with the success. I mean, they were, they include people. There's some people who are not particularly well known, but they include Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, obviously, Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck, who was the most successful European statesman of the 19th century, Winston Churchill, everyone knows who Winston Churchill was, Marie Curie, the most successful chemist, physicist, at the end of the 19th century who invented radium which saved the lives of about a million French soldiers uh, because they could give them x-rays and see where the bullets were after in the wow. First World War um, and Leonardo da Vinci okay, so there are lots of different time periods that we're talking about Walt Disney who's you know basically fired the imagination of, of uh, uh, America and perhaps lots of people in, throughout the Anglo-Saxon world Bob Dylan um, Albert Einstein, and also Steve Jobs. Uh, Lenin is in there, Vladimir Lenin, <laughs> for his sins. Uh, and Madonna's in there, Nelson Mandela, J.K. Rowling, Helena Rubinstein, who invented cosmetics. Uh, Paul of Tarsus, the man who made Christianity take off. And uh, Margaret Thatcher. So, you know, all of those people did it their way and right. they all of those people were more like you and me but more so i suspect and one of the themes of the book is what do you need to do to be successful one of the staggering things that you don't need to do is to have um uh, a, a career which sort of goes you know basically goes uh steadily upward and onward all of these people had really severe reverses in their careers and i have had serious reverses i don't know whether you have but, you know, that's one of the things which is very important. Another thing which uh, is very important, which was an original finding, I didn't know this before I started to research them, is that they all had what I call a transforming experience. Mm -hmm. And a transforming experience means that you go into an organization or a period of time or 
uh, something that happens to you an experience and you're in, you go in as one person, but you come out as another person. So they have a transforming experience. I mean, in my case, it was working for the Boston Consulting Group because I was completely useless before that. And afterwards, I thought I knew the key to making money and being successful in business. And I still think that. Um, but, you know, that was my transforming experience. You know, it's, it's quite important if you realize how important uh, a transforming experience is to have one. So, you know, one of the things which I, I try and help other people who have, have achieved what I call reasonable success, but not, you know, really made the big time and, uh, and had a real impact on the world. I try and say to them, have you had a transforming experience? And most of them say no. At least they do if they're in their 20s, if they're in the 30s or 40s, they may have had a transforming experience. Um, but if they haven't, I say to them, well, you know, if you really want to be what I call unreasonably successful, which means more successful than you deserve in a way, uh, then, then what you need is a transforming experience. So how do you get a transforming experience? Well, you identify a, a, an area, a, a country, a town, a company, an organization, a movement, uh, which is growing very, very fast. It might be very, very small, like Boston Consulting Group and Bain and Company were when I went into them. But nevertheless, it's growing very, very fast. And it knows something that nobody else does. So can you try and find that, 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 that organization or that uh, uh, experience? And um, it's quite interesting. Once people start realizing that they need to learn something that nobody else knows, but some people know, that, and they join that group of people, in a sense, they become evangelists for that particular idea. Uh, almost like St. Paul was an evangelist for Christianity, you know. Uh, that was a very original and, and peculiar religion in the early days. Um, and, um, you know, it wouldn't have taken off without the, the transforming experience that St. Paul had on the road to Damascus when he believed that he saw the risen Christ and he was lifted up into the third heaven. <laughs> you know, you might think the guy was mad. Uh, I might think that as well. But nevertheless, it made him so immensely powerful because he thought he knew the mind of God. Mm. Well, that's quite a useful thing to know, perhaps, and, and so on and so forth. Um, from looking at your book, I get the impression that success is a byproduct of your obsession with something else, whether uh, Nelson Mandela or whether it's Winston Churchill, they had an obsession and then success came to them as a byproduct. So uh, at the same time, it feels frustrating that if you focus is to be successful, actually that's the longest and more difficult road. Yes, I mean, Winston Churchill is a great example because uh, he had about four or five different causes. Uh, first of all, he was a, a rabid anti-socialist. So he wanted to save capitalism. That was one thing. And that didn't go down very well with organized labor <laughs> or with the majority, even of his colleagues in the Conservative Party. They thought he was too right wing. And then he decided that what he was going to do was um, make wonderful speeches and that wonderful speeches would trans you know, propel him to leadership. And everyone loved to hear his speeches. It was said that the bars the drinking establishments in the House of Commons emptied completely when Winston Churchill stood up. And it was like sort of going to the theatre, you know, it was, it was a wonderful experience. And in those days, I had speeches that lasted longer than most plays do. So, you know, they spent two or three hours, Winston would be on his feet, and it would be wonderful. It would be a performance. It would be fantastic. Um, but that didn't mean that he was going to be prime minister because uh, nobody trusted him <laughs> because he kept reversing it. You know, you know, as you said, he had obsessions here and then another obsession. And then he got onto India and he thought that Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi was devil incarnate. And that if we, if Brit British empire uh, gave a, a small measure of self-government to India, then the whole British empire would fall apart. And everyone else realized that Winston didn't know what he was talking about. But the thing that saved Winston was Adolf Hitler. Right. Because right. then he got an obsession that this man was really dangerous and would you know, destroy the free world. And it's like pulling a one-armed bandit. You know, you, you know, 
you keep doing it and you keep doing it. And then you get three gold bars and you hit the jackpot and all the money spews out. Well, it was like that. I mean, so Adolf Hitler was responsible for the success of Winston Churchill, although Winston Churchill was also successful for the ultimate failure of, uh, of Adolf Hitler. So it's quite symmetrical in a way. Wow. I'd like to ask you a, a question about your investment philosophy. You just mentioned a minute ago that you like to be concentrated in, in one area as opposed to spread over many diversification you say and of course because i have read so many books about investment i have swallowed the pill that i have to be completely diversified and you know uh, markets have been generous i have nice returns but nothing in comparison to to let's say you <laughs> so uh, how how can we look at this investment uh differently because uh, the, the idea of diversification is an idea that comes out of fear, out of fear of either uh, being in the wrong place or, but at the same time, we miss out on great opportunities. Yes. I mean, Alan, my philosophy is, is the star principle, which was something that BCG effectively invented, but they, they forgot about it sort of about a few years after they, They do. The star principle says that the companies that make most money and most cash in a business in the long run will be those who are the leaders. So they have to be number one in the market, but it has to be a very fast growth market. Now, fast growth doesn't last forever. I mean, in the case of Coca-Cola, it lasted for about 120 years, but that's exceptional. Sometimes growth only you know, lasts for two or three years. It's a fact. Generally, however, If a business is going to succeed, it needs to be in a market which is going to grow at, at least 10% a year. And I prefer them if they grow at 50% or 100% a year and is going to be able to sustain that for at least 10 years. If that happens and you are the leader in the market, you cannot fail to make a lot of money. You just can't. I mean, of course, you can lose if someone else becomes the number one in the market because they have a better product or better technology or better marketing or the rest of it. So the key thing to do is to, is to not invest passively, but to invest in a way where you can make sure that the company is doing the right thing. And of course, that means that you have to start with small companies because, you know, the leaders, you know, I mean, Jeff Bezos is not going to let you run Amazon or tell him what to do. But nevertheless, I mean, that is a star business. And that's a star business, which has gone for 20 years, up, 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 up. And of course, it nearly went bankrupt in, after the dot-com crash in 2000, but um, <clears throat> 1999, 2000. But it could, have, it could have all collapsed. But nevertheless, he has had this philosophy that there is a way to be the leader in the market. You've got to know how you're going to do it, as well as have the objective. And his, his view is if you have the best customer service and the lowest prices, you're going to succeed. And that means that you have to be very big because if you're very big, you can have buying power and you can, and you can basically also, uh, if you're in, I mean, in a way he's diversified because he started with books and now he's in almost everything. But nevertheless, yeah. you, use, you use your customer base in order to expand into new areas. And then you try and become the leader in each of those areas where you specialize. And it's, it is, It never fails. It never fails. So you, if you know it's not going to fail, you can just have one company that you invest in for 20 years, like he done. You know, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't become at one stage the richest man in the world because he had a diversified portfolio. You know, he did it because he had a very large share of an incredibly successful star business. Right. So friends, if you want to make money, and I, you know, I really have done this. I mean, for 37 years, My investments on average have increased compound by 22% after tax. Now, you know, that is as good as Warren Buffett. You know, obviously I'm very much smaller than Warren Buffett at the moment. Uh, but, you know, uh, and he's lived longer than me. But nevertheless, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just an incredible record. And it's not because I'm clever. I mean, we know I can't add up and all the rest of it. It's just because the formula is so good. Right. So it's just, I've written a book called The Star Principle. It's a very short book, um, very easy to understand. And if you're serious about making money or, or, you know, just having a good time in business, you must read The Star Principle because it tells you how to be successful. And it gives all the examples of the companies that I had um, 
uh, invested in up to the time that I wrote the book. Um, maybe I need to revise it because a lot's happened in the last 10 years and there are new companies. But yeah, you can't make 22% compound without having a very good formula and the formula's in the book. And then, again, it's not original, BCG right. invented it. And then, as I say, they forgot about it. I guess a uh, 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 pushback from my perspective is by the time I discover any of this company, let's say Netflix or Amazon, by the time they come into my radar, they are so crazy expensive price earning ratio. Like uh, Amazon, I don't think there's been non-expensive one single day <laughs> since it was founded. Same with Netflix, you know, all of them are in the 100 price earning ratio. Maybe the exception is Apple that is always uh, in a price earning of 20 to 30. So, mm. I, I mean, it's fearful to say, okay, this company is just have crazy valuation like Tesla. I think uh, price earning is on the 1000 uh, territory. And still I'm gonna put, I know a friend that who put all his money in Tesla and he's laughing at me because he has made over 100% return. But there's no way I could have put, uh, having a little bit of analytical mind, put uh, um, my money on uh, over uh, so, such expensive stock. So I guess that's my reservation. What, my tell, tell me, Alan, what was the what was the price earnings ratio? I mean, you not, won't know precisely, but do you know roughly what it was when your friend put his money into Tesla? He was probably in the thousands. I mean, Tesla has <laughs> okay, fine. So All right. Well, in the what, thousands. I, what I was going to say doesn't apply then. And in fact, I think Elon Musk has said many times that the company is overvalued, and and that doesn't that sends the shares down for a week, and then they start going up again. No, no. The, there's an answer to you, and the answer is you have to get in early. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yes. Which which is not easy. Right. But but if if you will invest. $10 in buying my book. It'll tell you how to do it. Perfect. I will do that. I will do that. And I'm sure my listeners will do that. Okay. So can you tell us one more time the name of your book and where can uh, the listeners uh, find it? Yes. This one? Yes. The one we're one. talking about originally. Unreasonable success. You just start, start unreasonable and it will show up in my name, Richard Kosh, K-O-C-H. Unreasonable success and how to achieve it. Well, and the other book is The Star Principle star principle the star principle very simple you know i uh, think we all secretly want unreasonable success we don't just want to be successful although that's available to all of us but uh, all of us have this secret fantasy of being unreasonable successful and i guess your book it will get us one step closer to that goal thank you so much richard not at all it's a great pleasure okay